So uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jonathan. Uh, that's Patrick over there. Uh, and we're going to present some work uh, that appeared just this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, uh, and our work was an attempt to understand, as the title suggests, the privacy properties of telephone metadata. Uh, so let me start with some prefatory comments. Uh, the first one, please ask questions. Uh, feel free to just raise your hand and ask at any point. Um, it's a lot of material to move through. Uh, and it kind of changes between subjects fairly quickly, and so um, uh, by all means, jump in. Uh, second, uh, the sort of obligatory disclaimer uh, that we speak only for ourselves. We don't speak on behalf of any institutions. Uh, uh, the next one, the law-specific obligatory disclaimer that none of this is legal advice. And then last, the government-specific disclaimer. Uh, while I'm currently detailed over to the FCC, um, I don't speak on behalf of the FCC. This is just my Stanford research. Okay. So that's kind of the stuff to get out of the way. Uh, now into the, the substance. Um, so I want to give a quick roadmap of, of where we're going. Uh, first, I want to talk through the status of metadata under federal law, uh, how, how the law regulates access to metadata. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, the NSA's domestic metadata programs um, and how the NSA collected met metadata and analyzed it for uh, counterterrorism and other purposes. Um, then I'm going to hand it off to Patrick, who's going to talk about how we designed our study of telephone metadata. Uh, then what we learned about the graph structure of telephone metadata, which has significant implications for the NSA's programs. Um, then uh, he's going to talk about uh, re-identifying metadata, so this classic question of is it anonymous or not, and what we found out about that. Um, uh, then last, some discussion of inferences that we were able to draw uh, about uh, individuals in, in our uh, study uh, just using their metadata. So let me start with the status of metadata under federal law. Um, and the first thing to recognize is that there are a bunch of possible definitions about metadata. There isn't just kind of one overall definition of metadata in federal law. Um, and the specific constitutional provision or statute can actually say um, uh, or be interpreted to say one of a, a range of things. Uh, so some of the definitions of metadata are colloquial. So sometimes courts or policymakers or uh, uh, folks discussing surveillance programs will describe it as data about data or the fact of a communication or whatever is analogous to an envelope, you know, the outside of an envelope in classic mail. Uh, sometimes metadata is defined with respect to how it's used in a business. So for instance, metadata is uh, the set of routine records retained by a business. That's the definition. Uh, sometimes the definition uh, is based in engineering. So it's kind of technical standards define what's metadata or what isn't metadata. Yeah? Is metadata actually used in uh, the word in any of the legal documents? Um, uh, the, the term is sometimes used in court opinions. Um, and it is uh, sometimes used to describe the scope of the Fourth Amendment's treatment of this area. Um, uh, the word metadata, I don't believe, appears in any uh, uh, federal surveillance statute, uh, or um, uh, it certainly doesn't appear in the Fourth Amendment. I mean, th that doesn't kind of have language uh, uh, specific to this. In fact, um, that's a great segue into the, the last possible range of definitions, kind of what, what the law says when it does specifically define the category. Some statutes define metadata as non-content, which is kind of not the most useful definition. Um, it's like what, uh, kind of by exception, but not what the exception is. Uh, uh, some statutes talk about dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information, whatever that means. Uh, some statutes list specific categories of information. So they'll say like name, address, um, uh, times and dates of communications. Um, uh, and then last, uh, the standard that's uh, uh, kind of uh, best known for being adopted by the courts under the Fourth Amendment, it's information that's knowingly divulged to a third party sometimes called the third party doctrine under the Fourth Amendment. And the rationale is you knowingly give the phone company phone numbers. You knowingly give your email providers the two addresses that you send to and you're from address. So, um, so that's sort of a last legal definition. Is there another question? Yeah. yeah I've considered metadata what SQL calls metadata, which is very different from what you see here metadata to be. Ah, so yes, important, important to be clear, uh, talking about communications metadata here, uh, file metadata, um, uh, kind of uh, a related but certainly different thing. Um, 
And that too is, uh, raises tricky legal questions because uh, while we focused on government access to communications, of course the government sometimes does want access to, to stored files. Um, and so there are questions of uh, what about the, those stored files can the government obtain uh, with a warrant and what does the gov can the government obtain uh, with lesser legal process. Um, and it raises very similar questions. Uh, okay, so uh, some good news about metadata. So for all the convoluted definitions that can point in opposite directions, um, for real-time person-to-person communications, the definitions point in the same direction. So let me be very clear about what I mean by that. Uh, so for communications uh, like, oops, sorry, hold on, here we go, uh, uh, phone calls, text messages, emails, uh, iMessage, that sort of thing. Uh, the definitions tend to point in the same direct, uh, uh, directions. The parties to the communication, the direction of the communication, you know, who called whom, who texted whom, uh, what time the communication was, how long they talked, or how many characters were in the communication. So in many contexts, these definitions do kind of match up uh, reasonably well. Oh, but that's not always the case. Uh, okay, so let me give a concrete example in the telephone uh, uh, context of what we're talking about with metadata. Um, uh, so, uh, it can include subscriber information. Uh, so, uh, if you've seen Blues Brothers, the Wrigley Fields at 1060 West Addison, um, uh, it's a great fake address. Okay, uh, uh, it, uh, and then includes kind of individual records, like the number that was dialed, the direction uh, of the call, the time, the duration, so something like that, um, which in, that's actually out of my phone logs, and uh, kind of uh, that was Chinese takeout lunch. Um, and uh, there are different names for these records. Uh, they're sometimes called call detail records or CDRs. Uh, they're sometimes called local usage details uh, for uh, local phone calls or LUDs. So if you ever see an, like, an old episode of Law and & Order and they say like pull the LUDs, what they're talking about is this information. Um, and something that's called dialed number recognition or DNR. So uh, for our purposes, essentially the same um, telephone metadata. Okay. Uh, another point to note about metadata just to complicate the legal picture even further, is that um, the competing definitions of metadata can result in multiple layers of metadata for a single communication. So let me be clear about how that works. Uh, so let's suppose uh, Alice wants to send an email through her email provider, uh, and let's call that email co. Uh, Alice will log in to her email company, uh, and that's going to generate some session metadata about when Alice logged in, what her IP address was, how long she stayed active when connected to the email service, that sort of thing. Then if you go ahead and send an email, right, uh, that you know, goes over to the email service, it might sit there for a little while, then eventually you know, the draft will get sent, um, and uh, bounce off to its recipient, and that's going to generate some message metadata. Right, so two kinds of met uh, metadata, one about how you're using the email service, another one about individual messages sent over that service. Um, and it turns out the law actually treats those kinds of metadata differently. Uh, there are different legal standards for getting those two types of metadata. Um, okay, so uh, th there's one wrinkle. Another wrinkle is that the definitions of metadata can point in opposite directions. And so I want to give a few challenging fact patterns to round out the legal discussion of uh, places where these definitions really have perplexed the courts and folks trying to revise surveillance law. Um, so let me give you three examples. Uh, the first, uh, communications that aren't person to person. So a person's talking to a business. Web browsing is a great example of that. And a, a, a question that's really perplexed the courts is what part of a URL is metadata and what part of a URL is content? Uh, and there's kind of general agreement that a search query, stuff off to the right there in this particular URL, which is an example of searching for a Stanford map, uh, that's going to constitute content. And there's great agreement uh, uh, among the courts um, that this information to the left, the host name you're communicating with, that's metadata. Um, but the stuff in the middle, who knows? Like, kind of depends on who you ask. And so courts have actually like, tried to parse apart, like, technology standards for like how URLs are formed to figure out like are these things metadata or not or what do folks know about this or what proportion of URLs will have information like that so we're just going to treat uh, assume that the rest of this is going to be uh, con uh, content too. Uh, it's a total mess in some. So okay so there's one challenging place for the metadata content definition where the law is just totally unsettled. Uh, another place where the law is finally settled, but took a long place to get settled, is stored communications. So webmail is a good example. Uh, Gmail, of course, being very, uh, a very popular provider. Uh, and the issue here is you knowingly give your email to, to Gmail. 
and so like in a sense, um, th th that definition of metadata applies even to the, the body of the emails you store. Uh, and it wasn't, in fact, until 2010 that the courts clearly recognized that the doctrines around metadata don't apply to the, to the, to the bodies of email you save with your email provider. Um, so, uh, and in fact, Congress still hasn't fixed this problem. Uh, so the statute that says you can get the body of an email um, without go, uh, going through the whole warrant process under certain circumstances still is on the books. It's just probably unconstitutional according to the courts. Okay, so another challenging example for definitions. Uh, a last challenging uh, 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 definitional area is location information. So uh, sometimes location information is explicit, like uh, the cell towers you're connected to. Some courts consider that metadata under the Constitution, some don't. Uh, there can also be uh, implicit locations, like an IP address or in the phone system a trunk identifier can say a lot about where you are. Uh, and uh, whether that constitutes metadata for statutory constitutional purposes, very tricky too. Uh, and in fact, that information can be really precise. So, like, uh, so for example, at one point I pulled my IP address from uh, my office upstairs um, and by using kind of public lookup information, you could figure out not just it's a Stanford IP address, not just it's the Gates Computer Science Building, but you, you could actually figure out which floor and which wing. Um, and so very, very precise location information, even though that's not uh, kind of any sort of explicit giveaway of location information. Okay, so there's the total mess that is defining metadata. Um, let me get to the punchline of what it means once information is defined to be metadata. And that is, in general, if a court concludes that certain information is metadata for constitutional and statutory purposes, first off, there's no constitutional protection. So uh, if, if data falls into the so-called third party doctrine, it's just not protected by the Fourth Amendment. So there goes one source of privacy protection. And in general, there's very little statutory privacy protection. So Congress can enact privacy safeguards beyond the Constitution, but in general, it hasn't gone very far in categories of information that are considered to be metadata. So that's the punchline for legal protections. Um, and to be very precise about the legal procedures that are available for obtaining this information, um, here's the, the kind of full grid. So it depends on whether law enforcement agencies are investigating a crime or a national security agency uh, uh, is investigating uh, a potential uh, national, national security threat or espionage, so on. Uh, and it matters uh, whether the information is stored or whether the, the surveillance is prospected. And in fact, it also matters, uh, in some circumstances, what the medium of the communication is. It turns out that, in general, internet communications get a little bit more protection than phone communications when, they're, uh, uh, when the records are stored. Uh, and so this is the full grid. And I want to highlight two particular orders on this grid, uh, because they're the types of orders that came up in the NSA program I'm going to get to shortly. Uh, the first is the business record order, or BR order. You may have heard about that in the news as Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. And that's an order that allows obtaining stored uh, metadata for national security purposes. Um, and the NSA used it to obtain telephone metadata. So uh, it's listed as internet there because you need to use one of those in general to get internet metadata. Um, but uh, you can also get phone metadata with it. Uh, and then I also want to highlight uh, pen trap orders under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, so that's another type of order the NSA used for metadata surveillance on a prospective basis. Um, and uh, the, uh, the NSA used that for email metadata collection. Uh, and the standard for both of those is not probable cause, like you, you may, be, may kind of have heard colloquially, that's the standard for a warrant. Um, it's, it's lower. Um, uh, and so the, the statutory standard uh, for, for, uh, for both is actually relevance, which is a much lower standard. The kind of hierarchy of standards is relevance, then reasonable articulable suspicion, then probable cause. Um, and so it's kind of the lowest level. Um, uh, the uh, NSA and FBI kind of reinterpreted the business records provisions. The standard wound up being a little bit higher than that, um, uh, but at least as a statutory matter, relevance. Okay, so that's kind of the full lay of the land of metadata and federal law, which is the sort of legal backdrop that all of this takes place against. Um, any questions on that before moving on to the NSA's programs? What was a D order? Uh, a D order uh, is named after 18 U.S.C. Section 2703D, D order, um, and it's a statutory creature um, that's sort of like a mini warrant. So you have to go to a court 
uh, and a, a court determines there's reasonable articulable suspicion, so that, that intermediate standard, less than probable cause but above relevance, uh, and then that's sufficient to get internet communications uh, metadata that's stored. So concrete example, some criminals using Gmail, and the FBI wants to obtain to and from addresses, times, uh, dates of communication, lengths of, uh, of communications, they can go get a D order, one of these mini warrants, without a full showing of probable cause. Um, in practice, it appears that D orders aren't used, uh, uh, aren't used as much as one might think. Uh, so subpoenas are used a ton for phone records, uh, for instance. D orders actually not used nearly as much. And the, the sort of uh, conventional wisdom in the surveillance law academic community is that by the time you're writing up uh, here's the statement of facts that gives rise to me believing there's reasonable articulable suspicion, you're presenting that to a judge, you probably already have probable cause anyway. So in practice, uh, de-orders actually don't get used um, quite as much as one might expect. Um, but anyway, in short, that's what de-orders are. Okay. Um, do you happen to know, are there any other countries that have done a better job at defining metadata for statutory purposes? Or um, I believe the proposed UK uh, surveillance reform legislation, recently proposed legislation, actually did pretty clearly define um, uh, how it would look at uh, internet traffic, web traffic specifically. And it would consider uh, host names to be eligible for surveillance under a lesser standard, uh, and then full content of communications under uh, a higher standard. Um, but I think US law has some things like that too. So for instance, in the National Security Letter Statute, um, uh, section 2709, uh, uh, actually spells out, here's what exactly you can get with a national security letter. Um, or uh, the subpoena authority for phone records comes from a statute that says specifically, here's what you can get in the case of uh, phone metadata. Yeah? Um, I can tell you for Swiss law. Swiss law does not tell you what is data and what is metadata at all. Swiss law says what you can do and what you can't do. How you name it, is not something the lawyers can influence. So I want to be very clear that uh, this is sort of synthesizing the law in this area. Um, very often, legal opinions do use the term metadata, um, but the, the statutes are written in terms that aren't that magic word. Um, they do generally describe what law enforcement can and can't do. So uh, this is kind of backing out of that definitions. OK. So that's the status of metadata under federal law. Now let me get to uh, the NSA's uh, domestic metadata programs and then hand it over to Patrick to work through our study. Um, so OK, uh, I want to emphasize that these are domestic metadata programs. Um, uh, at the NSA has been reported to uh, uh, kind of have uh, many other programs outside the US. I'm going to focus today on programs uh, that are domestic uh, and programs that have been declassified. Um, so the first program I want to explain um, is the, the earliest of the metadata surveillance programs by the NSA. And that was looking at email metadata. It ran from 2001 to 2011. It was then shut down. Uh, the FISA court approved it. That's a court that oversees FISA orders uh, in 2004. And here is the idea for that program. Uh, so let's suppose Alice and Bob are communicating via email. And Alice is uh, sending emails to Bob. Uh, Alice might use webmail, so there's HTTP, uh, might use SMTP uh, for sending mail, and Bob might get his email by webmail, HTTP, or POP or IMAP, um, and then between email servers, uh, SMTP is used to transfer messages. And generally, there's encryption and authentication between a person and their webmail service, or, or email service, regardless of whether it's webmail. Um, uh, and so there's a lock there, and there's a lock there. Um, but for quite some time, it turns out there wasn't actually great encryption and authentication uh, between email services. Uh, and so the NSA operated a program where they would observe traffic flowing over uh, 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 connection points in the internet backbone, um, uh, identify and extract metadata, and then store that for surveillance purposes. So that's kind of the, the early metadata program. Uh, the other program uh, uh, operated um, uh, for collecting metadata in bulk, approved later by the FISC, uh, was her phone records, is where we focused our study. Uh, and that program uh, began in 2001, continues to the present, hasn't been shut down, has been significantly modified. Let me explain how that is. Uh, and uh, again, was approved by the FISC in 2006. So here's the structure of this program. 
Uh, and uh, to note the legal constraints on this, pretty similar to the legal constraints on the email metadata program. Okay, so uh, uh, the structure was uh, uh, a government official would present to a judge of the FISA court uh, a targeting procedure on a regular basis. And the court would hand back a business record order, one order approving not just surveillance of an individual or a set of individuals, but rather that targeting procedure. Okay. So uh, kind of very different from the conventional surveillance model of, um, uh, uh, of having a, a one-off uh, kind of order approved like a warrant. Then the, the government would go to a telecommunications company and present that uh, business record order. And the company would respond with bulk telephone metadata on an ongoing basis. So that's kind of the legal vehicles used here. Now let me get to the operational details. So phone metadata flowed in from phone companies into a database of raw data, and it went back about five years. And at the same time, uh, the NSA's analysts would select uh, 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 identifiers, phone numbers, or other uh, kind of phone identifiers that they thought were associated with um, terrorist activity, uh, and they had reasonable, articulable suspicion to uh, believe that that was associated with terrorist activity. And they'd store that, th those targeting uh, identifiers, uh, selectors being the term, uh, in a database called the station table. Uh, why it was called that beats me. Um, the like terminology for this is uh, kind of idiosyncratic. Um, the NSA would then combine the uh, queried identifiers in the station table with the raw data and go out two to three hops within the data. We're going to get to what the hops meant and what those implications were in a little bit. Um, uh, and the resulting data was eligible for an analyst to inspect. That went into a separate kind of category of uh, data stored in a database called the corporate store. Again, why it was called that beats me. And individual analysts could an analyze that on an ongoing basis. And if they found something of relevance to national security, they could distribute the information. So there's sort of the full flow of information uh, coming in from the telecoms, targeting an information coming in from intelligence, and then intelligence products coming out the other side. Yeah? Whether there was a reasonable articulated suspicion. Uh, a line analyst would present the case for there being RAS, but then uh, a supervisor would have to make the determination. So it would be somebody in the NSA. That's correct. Uh, and, we're, uh, and I'm going to get to in a moment how that's changed. So that is no longer the case. Yes? And this is an operational program, not a research program. Correct. Yes. Yes? So analyst looping around on the upper right there. That's a different set of analysts rather than the one who started this. Uh, it, um, uh, I, it certainly didn't need to be the exact same analyst. Whether the analyst on the right had to be qualified for using data within this program, I believe they did have to have similar qualifications, you know, internal training around this program. But, but the question I was, is more. Would bad guys found one way be, uh, for one uh, suspicion activity be visible to somebody who's investigating some other activity? That is an excellent question that I'm going to get to in just a moment. Yes? Was, is this diagram meant to be a, to, uh, meant to be an efficiency thing or a secrecy thing? Can the analyst look at the raw data if he finds it? Uh, an analyst should not be able to look at the raw data. The idea was that only uh, qualified NSA technicians who are cleaning the data, uh, making sure it didn't include fields it shouldn't include, uh, would look at that raw data. That's not written into the law, or even the secret FISA law. Uh, according to declassified FISA court opinions, um, uh, individual NSA analysts were not permitted, under court orders, to look at that data. Thank you. Um, okay, so now to the question of what were the kind of ways in which the data could be used in various parts of this, this flow chart. Great question, and in fact, one of the very phenomena we wanted to study. So over here, as I noted, it was, it was counterterrorism purposes, right? The, the RAS had to, in fact, be associated with one of a specific uh, set of terrorist organizations. So very limited universe. But over here, from the corporate store, in fact, information could be used for any foreign intelligence purpose. And so that creates a sort of uh, unfortunate dynamic um, uh, where uh, potentially information might initially be identified um, over here for counterterrorism purposes and over here might get used for foreign intelligence purposes. Um, uh, kind of not uh, necessarily inherently troubling, but of course um, 
if a lot of information could be obtained over here uh, and used over here, it might create incentive to obtain a lot of information over here. Um, so one of the very phenomena we wanted to study, and Patrick's going to talk about um, uh, how much data, in fact, might be eligible by virtue of having just one or uh, small number of uh, uh, query numbers over on the counterterrorism side. Yeah? Just to be clear, it's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court approving domestic collection that ends up being used for foreign intelligence. Um, so to, to be very clear about the scope of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, it is actually primarily, uh, it primarily deals with domestic activities. Um, so foreign intelligence in the title of the act relating to the purposes of the, the surveillance is uh, uh, gathering foreign intelligence information, not that it is intelligence collected on a foreign soil. Um, in fact, in general, um, uh, intelligence collected on foreign soil isn't governed by statute. It tends to be governed by an executive order. Um, uh, I have a blog post from some time ago about that. If you'd like to see the full flow chart, it totally depends on where the collection is and what the medium of the communication is and what the status of the various parties are. Um, it gets very complicated, in short. Uh, okay, so now let me uh, note uh, what happened to the law uh, relatively recently, the USA Freedom Act, which changed the structure of the program and added some privacy protections. I'm going to highlight a few of them. Uh, uh, kind of going from the top left, uh, the raw data is no longer held by the NSA. It's now held by phone companies and held for 18 months, uh, which is the period provided for by federal telecommunications regulation. So the idea is to take advantage of phone records the phone companies hold anyway and leave the information with the phone companies on the raw data side. Over here, there's now FISA court supervision of targeting. So it's no longer just a, an NSA supervisor. It's actually a judge of the FISA court who determines whether uh, targeting information uh, is associated with um, uh, a terrorist organization with reasonable articulable suspicion. Uh, and then that two to three hops constraint how far you can look out in the metadata. Uh, again, Patrick's going to get into that in some detail. Um, that got taken down to just two hops. So those are the sort of core privacy protections for this program implemented in the USA Freedom Act. So we pause there. Any questions on the structure of the NSA's programs, um, uh, either for email or phone? Yeah? Do you know whether NSA expunged the five years' worth of raw data that they had had going back once the law changed? Um, there definitely was FISA court action on that issue. I'll readily admit I don't recall what the outcome of it was. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to say about the NSA's programs. Uh, now let me hand it over to Patrick to talk about the study we conducted. Uh, great, thank you very much. I've already got a microphone. I'm doing good. <clears throat> so uh, with all that background, um, the research that we wanted to do was sort of understanding exactly what the uh, technological limitations are on these NSA programs given the law that we currently know. So. Uh, First, we'll be talking about um, how we performed this study, and then we'll go into some results that we found. OK, so we're going to study telephone metadata. And in order to do this, we need to have a database of telephone metadata. Uh, so the question is, how are we going to get enough telephone metadata that we can and analyze it much like the NSA might, maybe learn some interesting things? Uh, well, it turns out, uh, if you go and try to ask the telecoms to just give you a bunch of telephone metadata, uh, they aren't super happy to just dump one of these databases for you. So we had to find a different solution. Um, and what we did instead was we're going to build a mobile app. And this app can be distributed to uh, volunteers all over the country, and they'd be able to volunteer their telephone metadata to us. And that way we'd be able to build a database that we could analyze and see what we could learn. Um, so we built this app. It's called Metaphone. It was available on the Android uh, app store for about nine months. And volunteers from all over the country, we had, we had volunteers from about 45 different states, uh, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico, were able to download this app and volunteer the metadata to us. Um, in total, we had about 800 participants. So here's just a little brief walkthrough of what it looked like to use the app. We have some you know, uh, information disclosure and legal notifications. Uh, we asked people to um, log into Facebook, which we're going to use for ground truth information for inferences later. And we give them some information about you know, how their metadata might expose them to analysis. And then they're done. Um, it's just a one-off uh, upload. We don't sort of have any sort of continuous collection. We just get the historical call logs from these individuals. Specifically, um, telephone metadata that we collect is uh, when phone calls were made, uh, who the phone call was made to, whether the phone call was 
uh, outgoing or incoming and how long the phone call lasted. We also collect similar data for text messages. Uh, this comes out to about 250,000 individual phone calls and about 1.2 million text messages uh, from our 800 participants. So there's a small drawback to this approach of getting volunteers to you know, give their metadata to us, and that it's not a representative sample, right? People who participate in this program are likely to be uh, more technologically aware or privacy sensitive. Um, maybe they found our study through tech blogs and uh, being on these. They're also Facebook users. They're also Android users. Um, so all of these things can kind of bias our sample. But don't you need acceptance by both parties of a phone call before you can get the data? Uh, no, we just, we just need the, the permission of the individual who's we're taking the data from the log. Um, yeah, so it's just the telephone metadata. It's not, we're not taking any, like, your phone doesn't store, uh, or we didn't have access to, like, the contents or these sorts of things. But a few just examples of how our database is not really representative, or our volunteers are not really representative. Um, so they skew young. Uh, we can see here that uh, sort of young people vastly outnumber um, people who are sort of middle aged or older in our database. Um, it also skews heavily male, so uh, more than 90% of our participants, or about 90% of our participants, uh, were men. Um, yeah, so this making it a little bit more difficult to generalize, but the results we're going to find, uh, we think, are broad enough that these sorts of selection biases aren't going to be a big problem. Okay, so uh, that was a bit about our study design, what we collected, how we did it. I'm going to go next into this understanding of the telephone graph structure. And this is going to be essential to understanding the reach of the NSA programs as they currently exist. And we can think about this kind of like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon problem, right? So uh, lots of people in Hollywood are connected to Kevin Bacon through this fun little game where um, whenever you participate in a movie with another actor, you become connected to that person. And there's degrees of this connection where I act with Kevin Bacon, I'm one step away from Kevin Bacon. Um, someone acts with me, that person is now two steps away from Kevin Bacon. And it turns out that a large number of actors are within six degrees. We're going to do a similar thing, but instead with telephone calls. Um, specifically, this is important for our definition of what we call a hop. This is going to be important for understanding the NSA's uh, power here. So here we have an individual phone, uh, phone subscriber on the left called a seed. And he makes some number of phone calls, right? In this case, he calls three different people. And each of these people are one hop away from our individual seed in the call graph. Now, each of those three people can call additional people. Let's say they each call three people. Now we have nine people connected to our individual seed in two hops. Each of our nine people that are in two hops away from our individual seed call three more people. And now we have 27 people connected to our individual seed within three hops. So as you can see, this sort of uh, the number of hops away from individual you can uh, go increases the number of people that can be, uh, that are sort of within these numbers. No, excuse me, that's a poor way of explaining it. Um, there are more people within three hops of an individual than within two hops, um, considerably more so. In addition, this also depends on how many people you call, right? If we were to remake this figure with now 10 phone calls instead of three phone calls, we're going to see 10, 100, 1,000 people away from one, two, and three hops, rather than three, nine, and 27. So uh, if we're going to limit the ability to investigate telephone metadata based on a sort of hop limit. We're going to say, I'm only able to query information about people if they're within a certain number of hops of a suspected terror suspect. Uh, then we have to understand both the degree, the number of people that an individual might call, and also uh, the effect of this two versus three hop uh, boundary. OK, so how do we know how many people uh, how many people an individual might call, we think it might look something like a power law distribution, right? Where some, a large number of people call a small number of individuals, but there's you know, a small number of people that then you know, call more and more and more people. What we actually see is something more like this. It's pretty close to a power law with a couple changes. Um, there's sort of a large peak around you know, uh, 10, 100 individual phone calls you might make. Not a lot of people make zero phone calls, so there's actually not just a you know, monotonically decreasing function here. Um, there's this sort of hump in the middle. And there's also there's this large tail where a couple individuals in the call graph actually call a tremendous number of people. And this seems a little strange, right? So like, how would an individual person call 10 to the 7 different other people? And the reason how this works is not actually, they're not actually individuals. They're going to be businesses. So this graph is taken from our 800 or so participants. 
And importantly, only two participants in our study had made phone calls to one another. And this graph shows, uh, so each one of these blue dots is a participant. And there is a little uh, an edge between two dots if there's a phone call between them. And what we can see is there are these massive hub nodes through major businesses, things like spam phone calls, right? You and I maybe have never communicated before in real life, but we may have received a, a phone call from the same spam phone number. And this sort of is like a primary function of spam, right? The whole point is to send as many phone calls as possible. Um, other good examples, things like if you receive tweets from Twitter via text message, um, all of those tweets are coming from the same phone number. So there's lots of people that are going to be connected through these massive hub nodes uh, in our data set. In fact, um, despite the fact that all of our participants were basically strangers with one another, on average, a single individual is connected to 30% of other individuals in our data set through these massive hub nodes. And what this does is it basically defeats uh, any of these, uh, it sort of makes this hop limitation totally useless, right? So while we might expect that having only two or three hops away from an individual would really constrain it to their like social group, what actually ends up happening is that you are connected to uh, perhaps tens or hundreds of millions of individuals in the United States through two hops through these massive hub nodes. So um, what we'd like to do then is estimate exactly what the reach of the NSA programs are before and after the change from the USA Freedom Act and sort of looking at including these hub nodes or if we're going to make a sort of assumption that the NSA is doing the right thing and removing these hub nodes ahead of time. So over here on the left, we have a figure that describes the uh, reach of the NSA programs depending on how long the collection period is for one, two, and three hops. So we can see that if you only have one hop, well, you can collect some small number of people. Two hops, you get more people. Three hops, you get even more people. On the right, though, we have uh, taken into account these hub nodes. And what this means is that if you don't remove the hub nodes, uh, basically, no matter how long of a time period you collect data for, um, we end up with you know, 10, 20, 100 million people being wrapped up in one of these uh, queries through these massive hub nodes. And in particular, if we assume the changes made from the USA Freedom Act, that is 18 months of collection and two hops, uh, and we also assume the NSA filters out these like massive hub nodes, what we get is about 25,000 individuals uh, can be queried from a single seed node under these new rules. It was considerably higher before, but this is what we have today. OK, so that's um, a little bit about the graph structure and how it limits the NSA's ability to uh, access data. I'd like to next, next talk about the problem of re-identification, that is, identifying the owners of phone numbers. We'll start with a bit of a quote. Uh, so it says, uh, you have my telephone number, connecting with your telephone number. Uh, there are no names in that database. Uh, and this quote was said by President Obama. So we'd like to understand what it means to have no names in a database. Uh, specifically, what we do is we have a big list of telephone numbers. How many of them can we identify the owners for? Well, we have two sort of approaches that we did in our paper. The first here on the left is we queried uh, automated and publicly, public and free sources, uh, Google Places, Yelp, and Facebook. It turns out you can like type in a, a cell phone number into Facebook, and if it's a cell phone number of a, of a person with a Facebook profile, you know, you'll get their profile. Um, Google and Yelp, of course, have the same thing for businesses. Uh, we can hit about 32% of phone numbers in our data set uh, just in these sort of free and automated sources. We put in a little bit more legwork. Um, we actually bought a month of this service called Antelius, which basically does this exact thing, um, but for a, as a commercial service. And we also did some Googling, um, and we were able to hit about 82% of phone numbers. So it appears to be that you know, in a totally free and automated fashion, you can do OK, and you put a little bit more work into it. Um, you can actually re-identify a large number of individuals, both businesses and uh, sort of uh, individual cell phone subscribers. OK, so that's re-identification, how we can identify who owns the phone numbers. Um, last thing I'll be talking about here is what inferences can we make about a person? Right? We have some information about them. We maybe know what businesses they call. What really can we learn about an individual? And this is really where the sort of the core of this uh, question about you know, how sensitive is telephone metadata lies. OK, so another quote. Uh, so we have about, again, the telephone metadata database. It says, uh, all it is is the number of pairs, uh, when those calls took place, how long they took place. Uh, so that's the database. And again, this is from the president. So uh, what can we learn from this database that suggests uh, telephone number pairs when the calls took place and how long they lasted? Well, we can infer where you live. Uh, 
um, seems relatively intuitive. You're more likely to call businesses that sort of exist around you, right? I don't call a pizza place that's on the East Coast. I call a pizza place that lives, that, not, excuse me, that lives, uh, that is right down the street. And so what we can do is, from the results of our re-identification process, plot all the businesses that you've called on a map, sort of find a cluster of businesses, and take that as an estimation of where you might live. And we can do pretty good. So um, given some sort of distance tolerance to uh, where you uh, list your location on Facebook, we can be you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent uh, accurate on predicting someone's home location. So what city you live in. Uh, we can also predict if you're dating someone. So you might think, well, maybe the way in which you call or communicate with your significant other is different than the way you communicate with your other friends. Maybe you call them at different times of day, or your calls last for longer, or you call them more frequently. Um, we can plug this information into a machine learning algorithm, and this will be able to spit out a prediction about uh, how likely it is that you are in a relationship. Um, and so this you know, chart is a little bit esoteric. Don't worry about it. But what we'd sort of like, ideally, if you could be correct all the time, is this curve would sort of be in the very upper left of this, um, uh, of this graph. But sort of just guessing is this dotted line. So we're doing somewhere in between perfect and guessing. Um, but with reasonable accuracy, we can predict you know, you, maybe you're dating somebody just from the telephone metadata. Um, once we predicted whether or not you're dating someone, we have a sort of simple heuristic for deciding who you might be dating. Turns out the most uh, effective one is just the person that you've called the most raw number of times. Uh, we can predict what religion you might be affiliated with. Uh, it turns out this is relatively simple. People who call religious organizations tend to call religious organizations that correspond to their religious affiliation. So uh, this is right about three quarters of the time. You find people in our data set who've called some sort of, you know, a church or whatever, and like, you know, reasonable accuracy, uh, that's their religious affiliation. Okay, so can we do even better? This is sort of some broad ideas. What can we specifically learn about a person from their uh, phone calls if we look a little bit deeper? So it turns out if you access the business records from Google Places and Yelp, you don't just get the name of a business, but you also get information about the category of business, right? So uh, whether it's a pizza shop, whether it's a hospital, whether it's you know whatever. So this chart shows the percentage of participants in our study that had at least one phone call to a business of a certain category. This is all taken from Google Places and Yelp. And we can see that lots of people have called some sort of you know, healthcare provider. We've got legal services. We've got you know, recruiting and job placement. Um, I like these two down at the bottom. So people that have called sort of adult establishments or even marijuana dispensaries um, maybe would reveal something about you uh, just from which businesses that you've called. Looking specifically at health records or health services here, we can break that down further into different subcategories of health providers. We see lots of people called dentists, but we've got a couple other really interesting ones, things like uh, you know, a cardiology clinic, or you know, um, maybe you've got, you're going for substance abuse treatment. Uh, these sorts of things might be particularly sensitive pieces of medical information that you could obtain just from these automated sources. Um, you know, Google says, hey, look, you've called you know, these uh, medical service providers that focus on this particular kind of thing. And this is all done in an automated fashion, but with a little bit more legwork, we can actually do much better. So I'm going to give I'm going to give five I think uh, pretty interesting vignettes individuals in our in our study that we thought we were able to learn a particularly p uh, sensitive piece of information about them. So we have a person in our data set who we believe has MS. Um, just take we were able to figure this out just from the businesses that are called. We have a person in our data set that we believe actually uh, that believe has cardiac arrhythmia. In fact, we were able to confirm this from publicly available records that this person did indeed, does indeed have a cardiac arrhythmia. We were able to make an accurate diagnosis just from uh, telephone metadata. We have an individual who uh, purchased a particular kind of firearm. We were able to confirm this one as well. Um, we've got a person who has some call patterns that might be consistent with starting a marijuana grow operation. So this might be of interest to law enforcement. Um, and last, we have a person who, um, based on their call metadata, we believe uh, was seeking an abortion. So these are all things that I think everyone would agree are sensitive information and that we could obtain at least you know, an indication that this sort of thing is going on just from telephone metadata. So the, this, this kind of concept that there's a distinction between content and metadata in terms of what you can learn about someone really isn't born in the facts. OK, uh, so uh, that's our discussion of inferences. And um, I just, just to wrap up here, um, two major takeaways that I want you to take from this, this talk. Uh, the first is that um, it's essential that 
uh, public policy, and in particular privacy law, is informed by the, rel the relevant sciences, right? So we had even a, a law passed, the USA Freedom Act, that was supposed to restrict the behavior of the NSA, but it was sort of passed based on intuition. We didn't have any actual scientific data to back up really how effective these changes were when we went from five years to 18 months and we went from three hops to two hops. What really is the reach of the NSA program? We didn't have the right data. And so it's essential that public policy is informed by uh, good science. And the second uh, is that we really should be involving um, computer scientists in the policy making process. So it's, just, it's one thing to be able to have publicly available science that you could you know, go and access and you know, activists can look to, uh, but it's quite another thing to have you know, policymakers actually listen. So we have to get uh, experts and scientists involved in the policy making process if we are to produce public policy that sort of accurately reflects, accurately reflects the wishes of uh, the public. And with that, I think we're done with the main section of the talk, and we can go into a Q&A. Um, a couple weeks ago, Whit Niffy was here, and at the dinner, I had a chance to ask him if he thought the United States, as a question of security, was in a, a crusade with the capital C, or a sort of culture war, and it's Whit's opinion that we are actually in the middle of a jihad. What's, what's your guys' feeling? Why are we, what's our particular need for security? I'm not quite sure I understand what you're, you, by the, the terminology. What, no, what's your opinion of the level of, of the kind of security that communications the American citizens need? So, so I think the, the sort of aim of the work uh, was really to avoid taking a position on what the right outcome is. You know, how do you strike the balance between uh, privacy and national security and law enforcement investigations. That is like so clearly a really hard set of pro policy problems. And I don't think we have any like special claim to knowing how to answer those, those questions. Um, but our claim uh, is, or I should say our, our kind of takeaway is, um, in figuring out how to answer that question, um, you need to make sure the policy debate is informed by the right facts. Um, because if you're going to strike the right balance, you have to actually know what you're balancing. Um, and so uh, that's where we tried to come out on that. Yeah. In the previous adventure of this, Kalia famously pro uh, provided that the FTC would set the standards for wiretapping, and the companies would then have to uh, uh, hold those standards. It looks not like now, with the current legislative proposal by Bert Feinstein, that they, instead of using the FTC, are proposing to use the courts instead. Mm -hmm. perhaps these secret courts. What are the trade-offs between using the FTC and using the courts for this purpose? You probably can't answer this, and I don't have the uh, expertise to answer that one, I don't think. Um, are, you, are you able to talk about this? Or? Uh, so let me uh, kind of explain the law around it. Um, uh, so, so the current law on this is... Um, the FCC, not the FTC, so, so the yeah, FCC. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, has an authority under the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA, um, that enables the agency to require certain surveillance capabilities. Um, so uh, a, a telephone provider has to make uh, metadata and content available to uh, law enforcement, and then there are certain technical standards for facilitating making that information available. Important to note, Kalia, with a minor exception that's not particularly relevant to the substance of this talk, um, uh, doesn't take a position on the right legal standard for obtaining information. Right? Kalia was about uh, kind of facilitating information given that law enforcement uh, is already entitled to that information. So it's sort of a, a, faci a facilitating statutory scheme. It doesn't set the level. Um, there is a proposal of late. Um, that would add kind of a, a, another means of facilitating government access to information that would be uh, kind of in tandem with CALEA. Uh, to note, CALEA already is not the only means of compelling assistance. Um, you may have seen uh, in the news um, uh, uh, relatively recently the litigation between the FBI and Apple, so that had to do with the All Writs Act, which for stored communications is a means of compelling assistance. Um, there's also some litigation about year and a half ago, ballpark, maybe more than that, uh, with a company called LavaBit um, uh, related to uh, compelled uh, assistance for accessing 
uh, email uh, communications on a prospective basis, uh, specifically metadata. Uh, and that uh, had to deal with uh, who got to control uh, SSL keys. Um, and that had a statutory component. So kind of to, to, to step back and give the full map, there's CALEA, there's the All Writs Act for stored communications, there's assistance for um, uh, uh, prospective surveillance under ECBA and FISA, and then there's potentially this, this new direction. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of kind of directions for assistance on the, uh, in the law and could be, could be more. Again, what we focused on was kind of the, the authority given that the government already had a means of obtaining the information. Um, this is kind of asking for a bit of a guess, but I'm going to try. So that was all communications records pulled from telecommunications companies using like cell phone communications. Um, a lot more, you've got services that are providing end-to-end -end communications in voice and text that are all data. So all data going over the internet. Um, if with communications like that, so like for example using Skype or iMessage for text and voice calls, um, how much metadata do you think or know is accessible? I mean, how much does that make that picture even harder to determine, assuming it makes it harder at all? It's generally available, right? I, yeah, I, I think so. I think this is, I mean, that information is, you could, you know, perhaps build, you know, a, a messaging service that basically used VPNs and things and tried to hide all of this metadata. But I don't, I don't think uh, the existence of something like iMessage versus text message, um, which is sort of being sent uh, via internet or other me or mechanisms, is going to fundamentally change uh, the presence of this sort of metadata. The way in which you sort of see it might be different, but uh, it's still there. So, oh, sorry. How much did this cost, and who who financed it? How many man years? What's the right ballpark on this? Uh, so I think we paid 19.95 for a month of Intellius, uh, which I think we used for like a day or something like that. I don't yeah. even know. Uh, and then we we spent like two hours on Google, like googling uh, some phone numbers. So it's just the two of us. There's no there was no fancy equipment. I mean, it's all. This, this was just fun as compared to a sponsored project. Oh, I mean, yes. So we're, we're both, uh, you know, funded by Stanford University in order to do research, but it, yeah. we didn't need to uh, purchase special equipment. Most of the, the machine learning algorithms that we use in this study are sort of uh, pretty rudimentary, as, as a matter of fact. So we didn't need, uh, you know, we could do all this in our office. How many man years went, in, went into this? A lot more went into editing the paper. Than yeah, <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. Are there any laws preventing? My phone company from selling my metadata to anyone who wants to buy it. Uh, so again, kind of in that mode of describing the state of the law without expressing an opinion on it. Um, uh, there is a uh, set of rules uh, enacted by the FCC okay. uh, that protects uh, your telephone records. Okay, thank you. But that's telephone records as compared to IP records. Uh, that that that's correct. Um, and in fact, um, there is. Uh, again, describing, not expressing an opinion, uh, uh, there is a current proposed rule from the FCC uh, that would impose similar protections uh, for uh, ISP records, so uh, IP addresses and potentially uh, much more than that. And the deep packet inspection? Uh, uh, so the, the, um, uh, the FCC's proposal seeks comment on that. Um, one important thing to note about deep packet inspections, that's where an ISP looks in the contents of packets flowing by. Uh, so for instance, looking at the body of the web page, or potentially looking at the URL of a web page. It's not entirely clear whether URLs would be considered DPI or not. Um, uh, that could implicate wiretapping protections. Um, it, it's an open legal question. Um, so uh, kind of two bodies of law in that. There's what the FCC does, and then there's also kind of uh, federal and state wiretapping protections. Um, if uh, one of your participants had called, made an international call, would that have been included in your analysis? Yes, so all of the, we have basically all the phone records that were stored, you know, in the default Android little call logs, so you go look at your past well, history. I, I was thinking more in terms of the uh, office. Uh, yes, we, we didn't distinguish between international and domestic calls in that way.
Yeah. Could you comment on life at the FCC? You said on assignment or something. What were you assigned from? Or um, yeah, so uh, I'm uh, uh, kind of on detail from Stanford uh, to the FCC um, and uh, helping the agency out on uh, technical issues. Um, uh, life in the government has been educational. Um, yeah, um, maybe happy to talk more about that kind of uh, after the main part is, is wrapped up. Yeah. In the back, you were next. Oh, sorry. Uh, do, you, do you have a sense for why telecom companies were collecting this data in the first place and storing it for so long? Um, so, so there, there's a uh, kind of clear legal answer to it uh, with respect to 18 months, and that is uh, under FCC rules they're required to. So, and then you mentioned that they were, there was like an earlier period where they were storing it for five years. Uh, the NSA was storing it for five years. Okay, got it. Uh, so they kind of stream into the NSA, and then the NSA would hang on to them on a regular basis. So it seems like uh, re-identification is the the basis of most of the inferences that you were drawing above. Uh, certainly, most of the sort of sources at the bottom of the slides were either manual re-identification or automated or both. That's right. Um, are there any other planks you might say to the inference, or any other bases to the inference process? Where, you, in other words, you don't you you delay or you defer figuring out who's who. You instead do some other analysis on the, a little cluster of people calling each other uh, without knowing who they are. Are there any kind of analyses like that? So uh, I'll say two things about this. The first is that the relationship inference is done totally without any re-identification. So um, that's just based on things like how long your phone call lasted or uh, you know whether it was late at night, this sort of thing. Um, we're limited quite a lot in two ways. One, we the sort of default call log implementation on Android only goes back 500 phone calls. So basically, we aren't able to collect nearly as much data as the NSA would be able to collect under the current rules. This kind of makes it more difficult for us to do a really interesting sort of uh, cluster you know, type analysis or whatever. And also, all the individuals in our data set are strangers. So we can't do any of this sort of like, you know, you might be like this because your friends are like this because we don't have any people who are friends with other people in our data set. If someone were to do more research with sort of more population scale data, um, these would be interesting places they could go. I believe that uh, during World War II, the Nazis went into Holland and used the, the call billing records to track down the Jews recursively, a transit of closure. And after World, at the end of World War II, the, they redid their phone system to fastidiously forget what calls had been made and went over to uh, a, billy, a meter that essentially <clears throat> ran as fast as the expense of the call. And, and when it went ran dry, your phone stopped and you put in more money. Uh, the phone system doesn't have to remember things to serve. Uh, I suppose that's certainly true. There's no technical it, reason. It, it's, a, it's a bound on the laws that you might conceive of. Yes, I suppose you could implement a law which would uh, force all you know, telecoms to toss any data about calls as soon as they were made. Um, that isn't the law as it stands, and sort of the goal here is to evaluate the reach of the law as it stands. Uh, but you know, from the graph we showed earlier, if you were to have these, sort of these like, three lines that went up, based on how long the collection period was. You can imagine if your collection period is zero days, um, you don't get an awful lot of information. Um, so a question on the 18 months and the applicability of that. Mm -hmm. um, I assume, but actually the question, um, do companies like Vonage, for example, fall under that as well? And the related question is, do companies like Skype fall under that either completely or partially, by which I mean, you can do a Skype call from Skype client to an actual phone number if you pay for it, or you could do a Skype call from Skype client to another Skype client. Uh, I don't know. I don't know this one. Uh, I'm not certain of the legal answer on that. I don't want to misstate it, so uh, I don't. Yeah. Um, going back to the relationship and system, do you have? It seems like you could really verify your assumptions with the individual study participants. So I'm wondering how you can control for the assumptions you're making and one of the tenets that you closed with was we should be making decisions based on science rather than just on inferences. Maybe I talk to my sister for an hour every day. It's not my boyfriend. It's a family member. Or maybe I'm calling somebody late at night because they're in a different time zone than I am. 
And so on, and so on. So I'm wondering how you sort of control for the assumptions that you are making. Right. So um, we have information from people's Facebook profiles. Uh, it, you know, on Facebook, you might post you know, whether or not you're in a relationship or not. Um, and that's how we're able to evaluate the effectiveness of our, of our prediction algorithms. Um, it's a little bit loose because, of course, what you post on Facebook isn't necessarily exactly what your relationship status is. Uh, maybe you are in a relationship, but you have single listed or something like that. Uh, so we, the data is a little bit noisy. But we're able to uh, do all of our training for machine learning based off of the Facebook ground truth and then evaluate it on other participants who have also posted their Facebook information. Um, and it turns out that these kinds of uh, features, like when you make the phone call or you know, how long the phone call lasts, is relatively predictive of who you're in a relationship with. But you're right, they might not work for every single individual. So um, what, uh, what follow-on research do you think needs to be done to investigate this whole area more? And, and as well, how, do you, how would you propose to inject more computer science into the political process or change some of the uh, views of, of lawyers? I think I can feel the first part of that. So uh, certainly I'd like to see this done with larger data sets. It's a little bit difficult to expand our methodology of just distributing things to individuals via an app because just reaching enough you know, concerned individuals is kind of tricky. Um, some research has been done in the past using corporate data sets, sort of data sets of metadata uh, delivered via the, from the telecoms. And if you had something like that, so a much larger database, and if you could figure out a way to get better ground truth about the individual subscribers, I think you could sort of reproduce this data, this analysis, um, but maybe be even more precise. And that would be an interesting way of looking at things. Right now, we sort of have a lower bound on the effectiveness of the NSA. Presumably, they have greater uh, you know, uh, resources than the two of us do. Um, and so if you could more accurately represent the uh, resources of the NSA, you could sort of get a better picture of what they're capable of doing. I, th I think. You yeah, talk the about second part of that question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think uh, there's long been a sort of divide between computer scientists and, and uh, policymakers and government. Um, and uh, closing that gap is, is very tricky. Um, you know, kind of uh, uh, there are folks who devote their entire careers to influencing government policy. Of course, for computer scientists, that's never going to be the, the top line of what they try to do. Um, and so uh, I think there's an awful lot of work to do in uh, educating the computer science community about how to interact effectively in DC. Uh, an awful lot of work to do uh, in understanding just the legal principles of programs like this. I think there's kind of a tendency uh, to um, you know, treat law policy as sort of loosey-goosey subject matter. And uh, very often it is. Um, but it, it, it kind of does, there are definite answers in many cases, and understanding them is necessary to kind of studying where the law, law and policy are or could go. Um, so I think uh, interacting better in, in DC, um, potentially serving in the government, that's what I'm trying to do, um, and kind of understanding where the government is and uh, where its head's at, um, kind of pretty essential going forwards. Um, and there, there are some kind of glimmers of hope. Uh, a bunch of academic uh, institutions and individual researchers who are, are really sort of making a name for themselves now in, in their outreach to government. There is an organization which you're probably not familiar with, for reasons I'll mention at the end of this comment, which ought to be doing this. It's the Congressional Technology Assessment Organization. Never heard of it. The Office of Technology Assessment. It doesn't exist. It, it, it does exists. actually still exist. It's it not funded. Exists, it's just, yes, it has had zero dollars in the budget since uh, '96. Whoa. Yes. So. Uh, and uh, I once tried to lobby to uh, to get it back, and even the Democrats didn't want to didn't want to fight the fight. I'm not sure. I'd say that they were opposed to having it. Uh, so, so by by way of history, right? Congress used to have uh, uh, an organization dedicated to providing uh, technical input. Um, kind of, that's certainly one model. Uh, advocacy organizations have gotten much more sophisticated in this area. A academic organizations have gotten much more sophisticated um, in kind of linking their law and policy uh, to tech. Um, so there are a bunch of workable models, um, and uh, thankfully, uh, uh, very smart folks are trying lots of them now, which is great. So the Computer Science Technology Board is about to appoint a panel in this area. Um, yes, so the National Academies provides work in this area. The uh, President's uh, Council of Science and Technology Advisors does work in this area. 
Um, there's now for uh, cybersecurity issues specifically uh, through the Commerce Department an expert board uh, the administration selected. Um, so th there are kind of a, a range of different um, mechanisms. Um, again, all, I think all of the above are great. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think do you want to do the rest off the off the record, or do you want to sure take a couple minutes of yeah yeah okay. Sounds good. I don't know. Okay. That's you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. hasn't fixed this problem. Uh, so the statute that says you can get the body of an email um, without go, uh, going through the whole warrant process under certain circumstances still is on the books. It's just probably unconstitutional according to the courts. OK, so another challenging example for definitions. Uh, a last challenging uh, 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 definitional area is location information. So uh, sometimes location information is explicit, like uh, the cell towers you're connected to. Some courts consider that metadata under the Constitution. Some don't. Uh, there can also be uh, implicit locations, like an IP address or in the phone system, a trunk identifier can say a lot about where you are. Uh, and uh, whether that constitutes metadata for statutory constitutional purposes, very tricky too. Uh, and in fact, that information can be really precise. So like, uh, so for example, at one point I pulled my IP address from uh, my office upstairs um, and by using kind of public lookup information, you could figure out not just it's a Stanford IP address, not just it's the Gates Computer Science Building, but you could actually figure out which floor and which wing. Um, and so very, very precise location information, even though that's not uh, kind of any sort of explicit giveaway of location information. OK, so there's the total mess that is defining metadata. Um, let me get to the punchline of what it means once information is defined to be metadata. And that is, in general, if a court concludes that certain information is metadata for constitutional and statutory purposes, first off, there's no constitutional protection. So uh, if, if data falls into the so-called third party doctrine, it's just not protected by the Fourth Amendment. So there goes one source of privacy protection. And in general, there's very little statutory privacy protection. So Congress can enact privacy safeguards beyond the Constitution, but in general, it hasn't gone very far in categories of information that are considered to be metadata. So that's the punchline for legal protections. Um, and to be very precise about the legal procedures that are available for obtaining this information, um, here's the, the kind of full grid. So it depends on whether law enforcement agencies are investigating a crime, or a national security agency uh, uh, is investigating uh, a potential uh, national, national security threat, or espionage, so on. Uh, and it matters uh, whether the information is stored or whether the, the surveillance is prospected. And in fact, it also matters, uh, in some circumstances, what the medium of the communication is. It turns out that, in general, internet communications get a little bit more protection than phone communications when, uh, uh, when the records or address was, how long she stayed active when connected to the email service, that sort of thing. Then if you go ahead and send an email, right? Uh, that you know, goes over to the email service. It might sit there for a little while. Then eventually, you know, the draft will get sent um, and uh, bounce off to its recipient. And that's going to generate some message metadata. Right? So two kinds of met uh, metadata, one about how you're using the email service, another one about individual messages sent over that service. Um, and it turns out the law actually treats those kinds of metadata differently. Uh, there are different legal standards for getting those two types of metadata. Um, OK. so. Uh, th there's one wrinkle. Another wrinkle is that the definitions of metadata can point in opposite directions. And so I want to give a few challenging fact patterns to round out the legal discussion of uh, places where these definitions really have perplexed the courts and folks trying to revise surveillance law. Um, so let me give you three examples. Uh, the first, uh, communications that aren't person to person. So a person's talking to a business. Web browsing is a great example of that. And a, a question that's really perplexed the courts is, what part of a URL is metadata, and what part of a URL is content? Uh, and there's kind of general agreement that a search query, stuff off to the right there in this particular URL, it's an example of searching for a Stanford map, uh, that's going to constitute content. And there's great agreement uh, uh, among the courts um, that this information to the left, the host name you're communicating with, that's metadata. Um, but the stuff in the middle, who knows? Like, kind of depends on who you ask. And so courts have actually like, tried to parse apart, like, 
technology standards for like how URLs are formed to figure out like are these things metadata or not or what do folks know about this or what proportion of URLs will have information like that so we're just going to treat uh, assume that the rest of this is going to be uh, con uh, content too uh, it's a total mess in some so okay so there's one challenging place for the metadata content definition where the law is just totally unsettled uh, another place where the law is finally settled, but took a long place to get settled, is stored communication. So webmail is a good example. Uh, Gmail, of course, being very, uh, a very popular provider. Uh, and the issue here is you knowingly give your email to, to Gmail. And so like in a sense, um, th th that definition of metadata applies even to the, the body of the emails you store. Uh, and it wasn't, in fact, until 2010 that the courts clearly recognized that the doctrines around metadata don't apply to the, to the, to the bodies of email you save with your email provider. Um, so, uh, and in fact, Congress still has want access to, to stored files. Um, and so there are questions of uh, what about the, those stored files can the government obtain uh, with a warrant and what does the can the government obtain uh, with lesser legal process? Um, and it raises very similar questions. Uh, okay, so uh, some good news about metadata. So for all the convoluted definitions that can point in opposite directions, um, for real-time person-to-person communications, the definitions point in the same direction. So let me be very clear about what I mean by that. Uh, so for communications uh, like, oops, sorry, hold on, here we go, uh, uh, phone calls, text messages, emails, uh, iMessage, that sort of thing. Uh, the definitions tend to point in the same direc uh, uh, directions. The parties to the communication, the direction of the communication, who called whom, who texted whom, uh, what time the communication was, how long they talked, or how many characters were in the communication. So in many contexts, these definitions do kind of match up uh, reasonably well. Oh, but that's not always the case. Uh, OK, so let me give a concrete example in the telephone uh, uh, context of what we're talking about with metadata. Um, uh, so uh, it can include subscriber information. Uh, so uh, if you've seen Blues Brothers, the Wrigley Fields at 1060 West Addison, um, uh, it's a great fake address. Okay, uh, uh, it, uh, and then includes kind of individual records, like the number that was dialed, the direction uh, of the call, the time, the duration. So something like that, um, which in, that's actually out of my phone logs, and uh, kind of uh, that was Chinese takeout lunch. Um, and uh, there are different names for these records. Uh, they're sometimes called call detail records, or CDRs. Uh, they're sometimes called local usage details uh, for uh, local phone calls, or LUDs. So if you ever see an, like, an old episode of Law and & Order and they say, like, pull the LUDs, what they're talking about is this information. Um, and something called dialed number recognition, or DNR. So uh, for our purposes, essentially the same um, telephone metadata. OK. Uh, another point to note about metadata just to complicate the legal picture even further, is that um, the competing definitions of metadata can result in multiple layers of metadata for a single communication. So let me be clear about how that works. Uh, so let's suppose uh, Alice wants to send an email through her email provider, uh, and let's call that email co. Uh, Alice will log in to her email company, uh, and that's going to generate some session metadata about when Alice logged in, what her IP address. Uh, folks discussing surveillance programs will describe it as data about data, or the fact of a communication, or whatever is analogous to an envelope, you know, the outside of an envelope in classic mail. Uh, sometimes metadata is defined with respect to how it's used in a business. So for instance, metadata is uh, the set of routine records retained by a business. That's the definition. Uh, sometimes the definition uh, is based in engineering. So it's kind of technical standards to define what's metadata or what isn't metadata. Yeah? Is metadata actually used in uh, the word in any of the legal documents? Um, uh, the, the term is sometimes used in court opinions. Um, and it is uh, sometimes used to describe the scope of the Fourth Amendment's treatment of this area. Um, uh, the word metadata, I don't believe, appears in any uh, uh, federal surveillance statute, uh, or um, uh, it certainly doesn't appear in the Fourth Amendment. I mean, th that doesn't kind of have language uh, uh, specific to this. In fact, um, that's a great segue into the, the last possible range of definitions, kind of what, what the law says when it does specifically define the category. Some statutes define metadata as non-content, which is kind of not the most useful definition. Um, it's like uh, kind of by exception, but not what the exception is. 
Uh, uh, some statutes talk about dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information, whatever that means. Uh, some statutes list specific categories of information. So they'll say like name, address, um, uh, times and dates of communications. Um, uh, and then last, uh, the standard that's uh, uh, kind of uh, best known for being adopted by the courts under the Fourth Amendment, it's information that's knowingly divulged to a third party, sometimes called the third party doctrine under the Fourth Amendment. And the rationale is you knowingly give the phone company phone numbers. You knowingly give your email providers the two addresses that you send to and you're from address. So, um, so that's sort of a, a last legal definition. Is there another question? Yeah. yeah. I've considered metadata what SQL calls metadata, which is very different from what you see here metadata to be. Ah, so yes, important, important to be clear, uh, talking about communications metadata here, uh, file metadata, um, uh, kind of uh, a related but certainly different thing. Um, and that, too, is, uh, raises tricky legal questions because uh, while we focused on government access to communications, of course, the government sometimes does. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jonathan. Uh, that's Patrick over there. Uh, we're going to present some work uh, that appeared just this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, uh, and our work was an attempt to understand, as the title suggests, the privacy properties of telephone metadata. Uh, so let me start with some prefatory comments. Uh, the first one, please ask questions. Uh, feel free to just raise your hand and ask at any point. Um, it's a lot of material to move through, uh, and it kind of changes between subjects fairly quickly. And so um, uh, by all means, jump in. Uh, second, uh, the sort of obligatory disclaimer uh, that we speak only for ourselves, we don't speak on behalf of any institutions. Uh, uh, the next one, the law-specific obligatory disclaimer that none of this is legal advice. And then last, the government-specific disclaimer, uh, while I'm currently detailed over to the FCC, um, I don't speak on behalf of the FCC, this is just my Stanford research. Okay, so that's kind of the stuff to get out of the way. Uh, now into the, the substance. Um, so I want to give a quick roadmap of, of where we're going. Uh, first, I want to talk through the status of metadata under federal law, uh, how, how the law regulates access to metadata. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, the NSA's domestic metadata programs um, and how the NSA collected made metadata and analyzed it for uh, counterterrorism and other purposes. Um, then I'm going to hand it off to Patrick, who's going to talk about how we designed our study of telephone metadata. Uh, then what we learned about the graph structure of telephone metadata, which has significant implications for the NSA's programs. Um, then uh, he's going to talk about uh, re-identifying metadata, so this classic question of is it anonymous or not, and what we found out about that. Um, uh, then last, some discussion of inferences that we were able to draw uh, about uh, individuals in, in our uh, study uh, just using their metadata. So let me start with the status of metadata under federal law. Um, and the first thing to recognize is that there are a bunch of possible definitions about metadata. There isn't just kind of one overall definition of metadata in federal law. Um, and the specific constitutional provision or statute can actually say, um, uh, or be interpreted to say, one of a, a range of things. Uh, so some of the definitions of metadata are colloquial. So sometimes courts or policymakers or uh, 